So welcome everyone to our Griffin Greats series. My name is Adrian Finley O'Dell. I am the head of school at Royce Moore School. And today we have Amanda Van Allen, class of 2005. Hi. Welcome. I'm so glad to have you join us, Amanda. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. So I'm going to um, officially read your bio, if that's okay, as your introduction. Sounds good. All right. So Amanda started her career at ABC News in New York, where she produced for the early morning news show, World News Now. After spending a little under three years in network news, she landed her first on-air TV job for Fios One, a small cable station in New York City and Long Island. She spent less than two years there and headed to WFMZ-TV in Allentown, Pennsylvania, before accepting a job in Cleveland, where she would go on to win not one, not two, but three Emmy Awards for her reporting. Amanda recently moved to Philadelphia and is now anchoring PHL, wait, PHL or Phil? Mm -hmm. PHL. PHL 17 <laughs> Morning News, which is um, part of the PBS stations. We love PBS. And Amanda, as I, I mentioned, is a 2005 graduate of Royce Moore. And she went on to Oberlin College where she double majored, uh, didn't want to slack uh, at Oberlin. So she double majored in African-American studies and English. And she also was a two sport athlete in college playing both basketball and volleyball. Um, so maybe there's some basketball and volleyball from her Royce Moore experience that's uh, kind of great to hear. Um, but she wasn't done with her studies. She kept going and she went on to NYU for a master's in broadcast journalism. So thank you, Amanda. Uh, what an accomplished career you've had so far. We're so glad to have you join us. Well, thanks so much. I'm, I'm so glad to be there. I appreciate it. I'm like, uh, I always get so flustered when people like say nice things about me. So I'm trying not to turn red, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, as we were talking before we went live, it's kind of fun to put you on the other end because you're used to doing what I'm getting to do with yes. you today. Um, so uh, I, I know you probably don't really like having the spotlight on you as much. You like to turn it on others. Yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But honestly, I had a lot of fun. I was watching some of your pieces online um, that you've reported on, and it was a lot of fun seeing um, your personality shine and um, the fun that you're having. Um, but you also cover some really serious topics, uh, mm -hmm. particularly when you were doing the evening news. Yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that uh, transition for you um, from evening news and, and more reporting. Uh, I know you were a fill-in anchor, I think, in the evening mm -hmm. news, and now you are an anchor and reporter in the morning news, very, very different kind of experience. Um, what can you share with us about that transition? Sure. So um, at first, it wasn't really an easy transition for me because I am just so used to, um, and this was drilled into me uh, when I was doing broadcast journalism at NYU. Um, you know, news is serious. We have to uh, make sure that we get people the information they need um, to be safe in their community, uh, know what's going on, um, and also know what's going on uh, across the country uh, because that's that's really, really important. And so, you know, I sort of had that drilled into me. Um, we, we didn't do much fun stuff. It was just all about hard news, breaking news. Um, and so I kind of did that for uh, most of my career, most of my early career. Um, I did most of that stuff. And uh, it was all about finding the hard news story, um, what politician was doing something wrong, what person was wronged that I could help. Um, and so I did that for years and years and years. Um, and when I moved to Philadelphia, I actually moved without a job. Uh, my wonderful wife, she's an attorney. 
And uh, she got this amazing opportunity to come to Philly and open a branch of a law firm that she was working at. Um, and so that's a kind of opportunity you don't really pass up. <laughs> Oh, that's terrific. <laughs> um, yeah, wow. it, was, it was quite wonderful. So, um, so we're like, all right, we're just going to figure it out. Um, and I came to Philly, I interviewed at uh, several different news stations here. Um, but it sort of turned out that I got this wonderful job at PHL 17. Um, I'm a morning anchor there now. And for those of you guys who watch the morning news and watch the evening news, you know, there's just a big difference. Morning news, we laugh, we're joking. We're not trying to, you know, scare people too much much before they walk out the door. I mean, <laughs> coffee, like you gotta wake up first, you know? <laughs> exactly, not too much bad stuff quite yet. Um, and so we try to be more lighthearted, more fun, just like have a good time with it. And um, it's it's a lot different from what I was used to. So I've, I had to sort of transition myself and transition my mind um, into understanding that, yes, what I was doing on the evening news was really important. And I still really do love that, but it's also important too to give people good news um give people things that they can like laugh about share with their friends and there are some of the serious topics as well but it's mostly um lighter stuff so you can um let folks eat their cereal in peace that's what we try to do every morning <laughs> that's awesome so how, how do those stories um get selected how does that happen can you can you walk us through um particularly some of the human interest stories that, you know, I mean, obviously there's your hard news stories that, you know, Just are break, breaking news and you've got to cover that, but there's all kinds of other things that you can choose to shine a light on. So how does that happen? Yeah, so um, for human interest pieces, that is mostly reporters going out into their community um, and figuring out what are the things that people care about, what are the stories that need to be told, and figuring out who are the best folks to tell that story. And so most of the stories that really stick with you, really pull out your heartstrings, really are, is something that you're going to share with somebody else was probably... Um, sought out by a reporter. And, and sometimes we do have people who um, come to us and say, hey, this really awful thing happened to me. I really would love for you to look into this. Or, you know, my landlord is a slumlord and, you know, our, our conditions are just awful. And can you please look into this building? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, sometimes it's, it's folks coming to us. Most of the time, it's us going out into the community. And, you know, that has sort of changed with social media, um, you know, now it's going out into the community, but also joining Facebook groups and uh, following certain people on Instagram or Twitter and sort of seeing like what they're talking about. Um, so it's all kinds of different things and sort of figuring out, okay, why should somebody care about this story? Who does it affect? And can I tell it in a way that is actually going to engage people? Mm -hmm. um, being a TV reporter, a TV anchor is totally different from white writing for the web or being a print reporter. For a print reporter, you can kind of do anything. And actually, I am very envious of this them sometimes because you're out in the field, a print reporter will be talking to somebody and they're just, you know, writing stuff down or they have their like little recorder and they're recording what the person is saying. And then I walk up with my huge like TV camera and I'm like, hey, do you want to talk to me too? And they're like, absolutely not. I do not want to talk to you. And it it's a little bit more intimidating to be um, a TV reporter. So um, it's very nice to um, be able to tell these stories that mean something, but then also make them visual. So that, yeah. takes a, that takes a lot of finesse um, and you can't fake that. You can't fake um, really caring about a topic, really caring about people um, because people will know and they will understand right. that almost immediately. So um, it's not just finding the story, it's also finding the people to tell that story. And then it's getting the people to trust that you are going to tell this story efficiently and effectively and hopefully get them some kind of change because most people don't want to be on TV just to be on TV. They want you to actually help them. So there is, that was a very long-winded way <laughs> to tell you that there are so many different things that sort of go into putting out these really important human interest pieces. Okay. So 
So thinking about that, that switch from the, the evening to the morning, you know, is, is there anything about the evening news that you miss now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of stuff about being a reporter that I miss. Mm. Um, you know, being an anchor is wonderful because you get to um, sort of weave the newscast and, and shape it in a way that sort of helps people get through it and get on with their day, get out the door, if you will. Um, and, and that is an incredibly important job. And it's a different muscle that I'm getting to uh, flex now, which is something that I didn't do as much before. Um, so it's totally different and I'm still learning and I'm still getting better every single day. Sure. Um, but I really miss uh, some aspects of reporting. Thank goodness they still let me report when I anchor because I, I, that would be something that I would be really sad to leave. Um, mm -hmm. Just being out in the field, talking to people, um, really listening to people and you know what, what their problems are. I, sometimes I go out for one story and you know it's not all the time that you are digging deep and trying to find these really important, cool things. Sometimes it's something that somebody assigns to you because they're like, hey, this is an important story. We need to do this today. Go out and find somebody who can sort of speak to this. So you're out there, you're doing that. Um, but in the meantime, people don't usually just talk to you about what you're assigned to do. They're like, okay, sure, I'll talk to you about this. But did you, did you know X, Y, and Z was going on? And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't know that was happening. And so, you know, you kind of get ideas for other stories. Um, and then you get ideas for life too. You know, they're like, oh, I really love this pizza shop down here and this hole in the wall, you know? And I'm like, oh, this is great. I've never been there before, but now I had new, have, a, have a new favorite pizza shop. Um, so interacting with people and being able to be around people all the time and just like talk to them and figure out like who they are and, and what makes them tick. That's probably what I miss most about um, doing more hard news. Okay, cool. Well, you mentioned finding a pizza shop. I, I think I read that you are quite a foodie, that you really enjoy going to different restaurants. <laughs> I do, I do. And it's so fun being in a new city now. Um, and now that the city has sort of opened up, you know, there's still a lot of like restrictions and things, obviously because of COVID. Um, but we moved here uh, in December. And honestly, for the first four or five months, we were just sort of cooking and in the house and nothing yeah. was really open, you know. Um, but now that things are a little bit more open, and it's really nice to be able to like explore the food of Philly uh, because we we just love it a lot. It's it's a great. Right. So for anybody who's watching today and they're planning a trip to Philly sometime in the next year or so, mm -hmm. is there a favorite find that you would recommend? That is really hard. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many good places. So I have um, I have a favorite. Uh, Mexican place so far. I have a favorite Indian place so far. Um, I'm still looking for a favorite Thai place. I have a favorite dumpling place that's called oh, Bing Bing. Okay. Quite amazing. All right. Um, but I, I will have to give me a couple more months. Okay. I will, I will write a list and I'll send that to you. You'll send it to us. Okay. So <laughs> stay tuned for anybody who's planning a trip to Philly. And uh, if you need advice, we can connect you with Amanda. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. What about Chicago? When you come back to Chicago or Evanston, or do you have your favorite haunts that you like well, to go to? You know, I have my first, you know um, so my uh, my family when I was at, when I was at Royce Moore, uh, my entire family lived on the south side of Chicago. Um, wow. So it was a very it was a very long commute uh, to yes. work every morning. Um, but since then, my mom has moved to Homewood. Um, and so there's a, a couple good places in Homewood that I like, but I will say it's like kind of cliche, but I just love Giordano's so much. <laughs> I just, every time I come home, I just want to go to Giordano's because it makes me really happy. Well, you know, we fully support that happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Giordano's, I always have to get Garrett's popcorn and I always need Harold's chicken. All right. Thank All right. You. Excellent, excellent points. All right, so I'd love to uh, segue. You um, shared with us just a minute ago about this big commute that you had mm -hmm. from the south side of Chicago to Royce Moore, and that was the old Royce Moore. So the commute yeah. was even a little bit more than it is today. Mm -hmm. And you came to us in seventh grade. Yes, I believe. Yes. So can you share with us what 
brought you to Royce Moore and then what made you stay? Yeah, so um, I came to Royce Moore uh, in seventh grade. Before that, uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, I was at Walt Disney Magnet School, so still a pretty good school. Um, when I was in seventh grade, well, actually at the end of my sixth grade year, um, I well, my mom applied for a scholarship for me, um, and I got it. Um, it was a scholarship from Oprah, which is like wild. Um, and I think it was like a hundred. She gave the scholarship to like a hundred kids who lived like in the city um, and they would be able to go to any private school they wanted to go to for four years oh, and she wow. paid she paid everything which was quite amazing and really the only way that I could have gone to Royce Moore because my family we didn't have a lot of money um, and so I I I went to a couple different uh, private schools. I went to lab, I went to Latin, you know, sort of the, the, the normal schools that Royce Moore competes with. Um, and I toured those schools and those would have been a little bit closer <laughs> for me. Yeah, that's a big ribbon, too. right? Yeah, but I loved Royce Moore and I loved the uh, teachers and I loved the students. I got along with them. The classes were really small. Um, and I just always sort of felt, you know, in seventh grade, you don't really know what you're doing just in terms of making this huge like life decision. But my yeah. mom let me make it anyway. Cause wow. she's like, you know, if you're if you're happy, if you like this, if you were going to be committed to going there every morning, sure, like go ahead and go. Um and so I took the uh I took public transportation. I took a bus to a train to another train. Oh my goodness. Yeah. What, so starting in seventh grade, you did this every day. Mm -hmm. Wow, such yeah. an independent. I was, <laughs> I was such an impressive seventh grader. No, um, <laughs> um, so it took me two hours to get to school and two hours to get home from school. Oh, amazing. Um, and my mom actually, uh, we were talking about basketball and volleyball earlier. So I was, uh, I was on the team at Royce Moore, um, and so sometimes I would get home at like ten or eleven o'clock at night because you know absolutely that's, that's how it was you know if you had a game or whatever but I also had a teammates who were wonderful and other Royce Moore parents who were wonderful if the game was like really late if we were very far I'd just like sleep over a friend's house and then oh. go to school the next morning so you know it was it was okay it worked out um but yeah that commute was wild <laughs> but it was it was something that um I don't know. I just felt like in my heart, this was the place that I, that I needed to be. And so I did it and I'm so grateful um, because I'm, you know, we'll get into this later, but um, I just met so many wonderful people at Royce Moore. Um, some of the teachers just really shaped me into the human that I am right now. Um, and I'm just so grateful for the Royce Moore experience. When I was at um, Walt Disney, I was an okay student. I was kind of like a BC student, you know, what, it was fine. When I got to Royce Moore and I was able to have that individualized attention and, you know, teachers would call my mom if I didn't like do something. <laughs> <laughs> they knew how to get in touch with her, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was kind of that uh, very specialized uh, format that Royce Moore had that really elevated me um, to be an actually like pretty good student. I was a BA student when I when I left and that was pretty amazing for me. I was always the kid who had to try really, really, really hard to be good at school. Um, and Royce Moore helped me get there, which was pretty, which was pretty cool. So the commute, I think, uh, worked out. I think so. I yeah. think so. So it's so interesting that you went on to play both basketball and volleyball at Oberlin, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you know Royce Moore is it's not a, a not a big athletic program. Um, so, were you also playing um, club basketball or volleyball, or was were you able to leverage your Royce Moore experience and go on to play in college? Yeah, so I wasn't playing club. Um, I strictly played at Royce Moore, um, but I did a lot of like camps and stuff in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I was 
excuse me, I was just a very self-motivated kid. So whenever I had, you know, Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings, uh, if I wasn't going to church, uh, I was always sort of at the basketball court. There was a basketball court that was like half a mile from uh, my house. And I just kind of lived there all the time. And uh, yeah, so I did sports at Royce Moore and I made a tape and um, I got recruited by a couple colleges. So it was pretty cool. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And uh, why Oberlin? Um, so Oberlin, actually, I had no idea what Oberlin was. I um, am a first generation college student, uh, i.e. none of my family went to college. Um, my older sisters did, um, but they only went to school uh, in Illinois. And okay. so that was I always knew that I didn't want to stay in Illinois. I don't know why, you know, you're like 17, 18, you just make these decisions. And I just made a decision. I didn't want to stay in Illinois. I wanted to sort of go and grow and like figure out who I wanted to be and what I wanted to be. Yep. Um, so I started, you know, sort of looking at these schools and thank goodness for um, Mrs. Klein. And uh, she was my uh, college counselor there at Royce Moore. She was also my French teacher, which is very cool. Um, and thank goodness for her because she really sort of helped me figure out, okay, what am I looking for? And then when I could really start to start to think about like what worked for me when I was at Royce Moore, was um, being in these really small classrooms with um, uh, teachers who really were invested in me. And she's like, okay, so if, if that makes you happy, you're going to have to go to like a much smaller school. And, you know, so we, we sort of went through that motion and we came right. up with a, a list of colleges that might work for me. Um, I was able to visit all these schools and I picked Oberlin. So, mm -hmm. well, and then you had to combine sort of the, the best fit with also your college, your athletic recruiting, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a whole nother piece, which yeah. can be kind kind of complex. Yeah. So uh, so Oberlin and and most of the schools that I was looking at were like small liberal arts colleges. So they were all Division three schools, mm -hmm. um, which is you know a little a, a lot different actually from you know being recruited by a Division one school. So a Division three school, they I sort of was doing things on the academic end. And I said, oh, I'm applying to this school. I want to go to this school. And then you sort of shoot a note to the basketball coach or the volleyball coach or, you know, what have you. Um, and then if they look at your stuff and they're interested, then they can start actively, you know, recruiting you from there. I think things are like a lot different now. Um, mm -hmm. That was when did I graduate from college? 2009. So that was like 15 plus years ago. Um, and so, so things are a little bit different in the recruiting process that di is different now, but um, I really picked Oberlin, you know, for its academics. And it was just sort of a cherry on top that I could play basketball and play volleyball. And actually I was not recruited to play volleyball. I was strictly recruited to play basketball. Um, and I got there and uh, I was talking to the volleyball coach one day and I was like, oh yeah, I played volleyball in high school, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, you did? She's like, you're really fast. Like, I think you should try out for the volleyball team. So, yeah, the rest is history. But that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So when you uh, were in high school, were there any um, were there any experiences you had, whether in classes or maybe January short term that would point to what you're doing in your career today? Hmm. I don't, I'm trying to think of a specific, um, like a specific class or a specific something. I mean, I really think I just talk too much in school. <laughs> and that's sort of what leveraged my career, honestly. Um, but if I was to think of anything specific, um, we had uh, what was then called the Community Service Club. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, I believe Miss Radke was the one who um, sort of put that club together. And so that- She's still, she's still doing it. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, I love it. Um, she got so, married, she got married. And so she is now Miss Radke Burns. Okay, okay, wonderful. So Miss Radke Burns. 
um, she she was the one who sort of put that together. And I think from that and from sort of doing um, things out in the community and helping folks, I think that's kind of where I started to like really understand that I wanted to do something where I could just like talk to people and be myself and like help people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I cannot sit here and say that like what I do every single day is a community service, like absolutely not. Um, but sometimes, sometimes it is and sometimes it really does help people and sometimes I do get to change people's lives, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and so probably from that, um, which is, you know, obviously it wasn't an academic class, but um, it helped me figure that out a little bit. Yeah. What um, it, I'm sure your foundations in English, you know, may have then prompted you to decide to major in English. Yeah, yeah. So um, I really, I was sort of the typical liberal arts kid who came into college not knowing what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, and I actually found um, African American studies first before mm. I found English because um, mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't really get there were no like specific African American studies classes like offered at Royce Moore mm -hmm. um, and I've always been interested I mean I'm a black woman so um, you know learning more about like where I came from, um, things like that was really important to me. So um, when I got to Oberlin, they had not only classes, but they had a major sort of centered around this. Um, and so I found that first and that was wonderful. And I think I got a little bit excited about the major because <laughs> I think I finished it like end of sophomore year, something like that. It was wild. I just was I'm taking trying. so many classes. Um, okay. And then that's when I sort of said, okay, I, I know I love African American studies. I don't really know what I'm going to do with this. Um, but then I started thinking about like the things that I'm good at, which is writing um, and uh, sort of fell into the English major as well. And then kind of had to catch up because everybody else had done you know, so much for their major already um, by the time I joined. But then I just went full force and figured it all out. So at what point did you um, decide you wanted to pursue broadcast journalism? I decided that my junior year um, of college and that there was no aha moment or anything where, I, where somebody walked into the room and they're like, you should be on TV. Like nothing like that happened. <laughs> um, I just sort of people people were sort of starting to figure out what they wanted to do with their lives. And people started talking about, oh, I'm going to law school, or I'm going to be a doctor, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to be an economist, whatever. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> I don't really know what I'm going to do yet. Um, so I really just sat down and thought about the things that I was good at, the mm -hmm. things that I really liked, um, which is talking to people, being myself, dressing up that was also something I really liked that was cool um and and I sort of said okay you know uh, reporting like kind of interests me I wasn't really sure um and then it was like right before the summer um of my junior year going into my senior year and so I was like all right let me try to get like a journalism internship um, back at home. So um, I applied for a bajillion. Uh, I, I got one, thank goodness, because that all you need is one. All, all you need is one yes, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, so I got an internship at um, PBS <laughs> um, at Chicago Tonight. Um, and so that was wonderful. I got to sort of be in a newsroom. I was doing the typical intern stuff. I was printing out scripts. I was logging video. I was washing the mugs that the anchors had to, <laughs> had to use that evening. Um, so I got to sort of do all that stuff. And I was like, oh, I really like this. I got like a rush when I was there. And um, I was like, all right, I got to, I got to, keep doing this. Um, and when I graduated in 2009, um, in 2008, the whole world shut down pretty much. <laughs> so that was really, really scary for a college graduate. When yeah, it's like what, what jobs are out there? Yeah. That, I mean, there were, there were really none. It was, it was really hard. Um, and so at Oberlin, I ended up taking, I think there were like two journalism classes offered at Oberlin period. And now they have uh, since gone to, they had, I think they have a concentration in journalism, something like that mm -hmm. now. Um, but when I was there, they did not. 
Um, and so I was like, well, I guess I should go to grad school because it's either grad school or like sit on my mom's couch. Um, and I really did not want to do that. And maybe she didn't want it either. <laughs> she, likely she did not want that. So, um, so that's when I sort of decided, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go to grad school. And I really, really wanted to come back home. Um, I wanted to go to Northwestern's grad school. Uh, Medill is the name of their uh, journalism graduate school. It is one of the best in the country. Um, I got into Medill. I prayed every single night that I would get in. I was like, I know this is what I want to do. I know I want to go to Medill. I prayed and prayed and prayed. And I got in and I was, it was the happiest day of my life. I ran around Oberlin screaming and crying and it was such a great day. Um, and then I found out how much money they were giving me for their $90,000 program. Um, they gave me $1,000 to do this program. So I was like, well, <laughs> that's a little bit, that's a little bit much. Um, I a, also lot of debt. a lot of debt so much debt. And I knew being a journalist, I wasn't going to ever be a millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of had to decide. I also got into NYU. I got into Boston, I believe some other places. Um, and I, and I loved NYU. I think Northwestern is like number three in the country. NYU is number 11. Like, you know, it's still, it's still pretty great good. school. What are you going to do? Cool. Uh, NYU gave me so much more money. Um, they gave the, the program was three semesters long. They paid for two semesters. Oh. Um, and actually when I, when I got there, um, and I was doing really well, um, I pulled one of my professors aside and I was like, is there any way you guys can pay for like the third semester too, <laughs> which they ended up doing, which was wonderful. Wow. Congratulations. Um, That's yeah, amazing. Thank you. thank you. Um, so you know, that doing that really, really um, changed my life. Going to New York City, um, the number one news market in the country, the place where really all news starts and ends in New York City. It was really an amazing time in my life. And, you know, while I wish I could have gone to Northwestern and be near my family and watch my little brothers and my, my nephews grow up, that would have been so wonderful. I'm so happy that I was able to go to NYU. Um, I learned so much and I was able to uh, get all of the internships that students from across the country really wanted, but I got because I was there, you know, so it truly changed my life. I, I will never forget the very first um, story that I ever did, which is, you know, pretty ironic because today is September 11th. Well, I was um, just going to ask about that. Yes. Because you were there. Mm -hmm. That was the 10 year anniversary, right? Yeah, well, it sure was. And our very first assignment before we read any book, did anything, she said, I want you guys to go to the September 11th memorial service and I want you guys to find a story. And when I tell you that I was probably the most scared that I have ever been in my entire life, going there during such an emotional time um, and just not knowing really anything about journalism or how to, how to write a journalistic story or how to even approach people uh, during such an emotional day, that was probably the hardest day <laughs> ever in, in my reporting, but you know, it turned out it, the story was awful. The story that I wrote was horrible, I was <laughs> but I learned that I got better. Um, and, you know, we continue to go to those 9-11 memorials. And then I was actually able to uh, share some stories that really meant something um, as opposed to what I wrote the first year, which was not great at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years since mm -hmm. that, that happened. And, um, you know, it, it is my generation's Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. right? you know, we, we remember where we were. Yep. Um, and I, I, yeah, it was crazy times forever changed the course mm -hmm. of our lives. Yep. Much like, you know, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, you know, the generation now, it's the pandemic. Yes. You know, it's, it's a very, very different attack, mm -hmm. but it is a, it's a global um, event that everyone is experiencing simultaneously. Yes. Right. And being impacted by, you know, I would 
I would say more than Pearl Harbor or 9-11 at the time. Yes, right, absolutely. So how has the pandemic affected you as a journalist? Oh, uh, so much, so, so much. Um, when the pandemic first started, I was still in Cleveland. Mm. Um, and just sort of seeing it, we, we saw it when it uh, was in Wuhan and uh, people were saying like, it's probably going to come to the United States. It's probably going to come to the United States. And, and we were sort of prepping for that, but we didn't really know what we were prepping for. It was just yeah, like, us did. yeah, exactly. <laughs> we were all learning together. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I remember doing this story with this, um, with this young woman who uh, did a Skype with her. She was from Cleveland, was in Wuhan for, I think, work. I think she was teaching English um, to children there. And she was stuck in her apartment. And I remember just being, listening to her story and telling her story and just being so terrified because I'm like, oh my gosh, what, what would I do if, if COVID came here? What if I had to sort of be stuck in, in my apartment? And, you know, not to make things about you, but those are the things that sort yeah, of- And at that time, it seemed unimaginable. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Um, and so, you know, it did come. I, I don't remember which state it first came to or it was first recorded coming to. Um, but I remember when it came to Ohio, things just got really crazy after that. Um, you know, everything shut down. Um, us as report, I was a, a reporter obviously fill an anchor at a time, we weren't allowed to come into the station at all. Um, so it was a work from home slash really like kind of work from your car, um, which was, <laughs> that was, that was awful, but not the first time I have worked for my car as a reporter. So there's that. Um, and th something that you would probably like never think of, but it was an awful, awful time, mostly because we couldn't use the bathroom anywhere. Oh, um, yes. when, you're, when you're a reporter, you pretty much rely on public bathrooms all the time and everything was closed. And so I, our solution to this was just not drink as much water, which is not very oh, healthy. It's terrible for your, for your well-being. <laughs> right. It was that healthy, but you kind of did what you had to do because so many people, just like a 9-11, a when folks are terrified and they turn on the TV because they rely on us to right. help them figure out what the heck is going on out there. Um, just like 9-11, when COVID hit, folks were turning on the TV so much more. So it was constant, yeah. just back to back to back where, you know, we're telling this person's story and that person's story. And also we need to tell you guys, what are the new regulations out there? Then we need to take the governor's press conference live. And then we need to sort of recap after that, what the heck happened? What did he, you know, what did he really say? And then there's all these people dealing with unemployment problems that we're trying to help who weren't getting their money. Then there's food lines wrapping around the block and we need to tell those stories too. So, I mean, it was story. just, it was, it was an awful, awful thing happening, but a time where I was probably most proud to be a journalist because people were so reliant on us and I was so happy to be able to go out there, get the information they needed, give it to them, and they didn't have to do it for themselves. They didn't have mm -hmm. to go, you know, seek that out or be confused or, you know, whatever the case was. And it, and it was hard too, you know, sort of putting your body on the line because then we didn't, we didn't really know what was going on so we're you know we're at first we weren't wearing masks and then we were wearing masks and we had these like six foot long poles to interview people it was a it was awful and it's still happening right yeah. like I, yeah. I had to I had to um interview some folks for this 9-11 story that I was doing and I just remember thinking about how bizarre it was to you know be talking to somebody about this really emotional thing and to have two masks on and a six foot pole trying to connect with this person on a deeper level it was just it was awful and it continues to be awful um, and it will continue and so until we sort of get this whole thing under control and, and who knows when that will be. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, really courageous of you to be out there on the front lines and tell these stories. And, you know, clearly um, the powers that be have recognized your good work with these Emmys. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I would love to hear if, if there's, um, whether it's one of those stories yeah. that um, were recognized or another story that you are most proud of yeah. that, that is kind of like when you sit with your heart about, you know, why you're in this work mm -hmm. and a story that you feel most proud of or happy to have covered, um, what, what comes to mind? Yeah, so um, I won three Emmys, like you said. Um, the first two, uh, well, really all of them were for incredibly tragic stories, mm. um, unfortunately. Uh, the first two, uh, one was for breaking news. The other was for um, uh, evening newscast. Um, and it was all centered around this little girl, seven years old, um, who was killed. And I won't go into the details because I still kind of like tear up when I think about it. But um, what I do remember most was the breaking news was the night of when it first happened. We heard things over the scanners and you sort of rushed to the scene. And I remember um, standing there and talking to this politician. A lot of times when things like this happen, politicians will come out to, you know, where it's happening. And, you know, as a journalist, sure, you want to talk to those people, I guess, you know, you don't. When things like that happen, the politicians aren't really the people that you care about. You really want to talk to the folks in the community because those are the folks who are truly affected. But the politician right. was there. It's 30 minutes till I need to go on the air. I'm going to talk to the politician. So I start talking to him. And maybe five minutes into our conversation, uh, this man just starts like talking like really loudly. And he says, they killed my baby. They killed my baby. And, you know, I sort of nudge my camera person and I tell him to spin the camera around. And I was like, I'm sorry, sir, what, what did you say? Did you say that that was your daughter? And he's like, yeah, they killed my baby. And he just starts pouring his heart out to me um, and telling me how incredibly broken he is. And I, I'm trying to be as sensitive as possible in, in a situation like this. You don't want to ask him, well, you know, what do you think about, how do you feel right now? Like, that's a really stupid question. And I, and I will never, ever be that person. Um, so you're trying to sort of, you know, ask them, ask them things and try to, you know, hear, hear what they, what they want to say, you know, at that moment. Um, so I only talked to him for a few minutes. And when I was done talking to him, um, a very large group of men sort of all came around him um, and they placed their hands on his shoulder and they all started praying for him. And I just remember in that moment thinking, thank God they are all here and they are all here to wrap their arms around him during the worst night of his entire life. Um, and in those moments, you kind of feel like you are, an outsider you kind of feel like you're not supposed to be there you kind of just want to turn the camera off and and let them do what they're doing but then you sort of realize if you don't show this stuff if you don't sh show the hurt the pain everything that sort of goes into this then it's going to keep happening um you you would hope that maybe seeing this dad grieving so much will convince somebody to put the gun down and that's just sort of what you you have to hope. Um, so that was a, a, a really awful story. The very next day, um, we continue to follow this story. Obviously, a, a young girl gets killed. You don't just move on the next day. Um, and the next day, I talked to uh, the young girl's mother, which was another very awful that's experience. Very yeah. Um, yeah, so so that was that. Um, I do want to talk about a, a more positive story, though. I didn't start out being positive. This is one of those things where um, a viewer called us, and she called me, and she says, um, I'm homeless, and uh, I was trying to take my kids to the shelter with me, and I have a 7-year-old and a 13-year-old, and they told me that the 13-year-old, since he's a boy, he can't stay with me. And he has to go to another shelter where they, you know, have young boys. 
And I thought, well, it doesn't seem right, especially when somebody is at the lowest point of their life and they are seeking help. That's really not something that you do. So I'm like, okay, this, this can't be right. Like some, something's going on here. I contact the shelter and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, uh, we split up the boys and that's, that's just what we do. And yeah, we can't, I was like, okay, so like, what about the girls? Like, are there 13 year old girls? And they're like, no, 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 we let the girls stay and we, we make the boys go somewhere else. And so I'm thinking to myself, these are mostly young boys of color who are in this situation. So already we are telling them something is wrong with you. You are a predator and you can't be trusted around right. these women. Terrible um, message. And so I did my thing. Long story short, um, there was a lawsuit filed against um, the shelter and uh, a lot of things sort of transpired. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping it's actually still in the works right now, but I'm hoping that they are going to be changing their policy um, because of this woman coming forward and telling her story. So um, that was a, that was a really great, that was a really, really great story. That was, I think three different stories I ended up doing with her because that's the kind of thing you can't just do one and be like, all right, cool. <laughs> Hope everything's well, like you gotta kinda, you know, follow up. So um, that, that was probably one of the stories that I'm uh, most proud of and something that I didn't even think to submit for an Emmy because, you know, it just, it just felt good to, to help people. Well. It, that is clear. It is clear hearing you share the story and what's in your heart and what drives and motivates you. Uh, so um, we're very proud of you for how you are using your platform for good. So thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. So I, I have loved this conversation and I have monopolized it, um, but there may be others um, who are tuned in that have a question um, or a comment. Um, so I wanted to just um, pause for a minute and see if there are any um, questions or comments from anybody who's tuned in. I think there, there might be somebody who's on the call that, um, Beth, is there somebody on the call who might like to ask a question? Not that I can see right now. Okay, all right, maybe not, maybe they dropped off. Um, yeah. Well, here's what I, I would love um, to make a little segue um, for our young people at Royce Moore who are intrigued by the idea of journalism and um, what you're doing. Um, what advice might you give to them if they want to explore this career? Yeah, um, I, I, I love talking to uh, folks who are potentially thinking about becoming journalists. Um, I think that Royce Moore students um, being so worldly and just having so many experiences um, that you do get at Royce Moore, I think that you guys would be wonderful journalists. So um, if you're thinking about doing it, um, please explore a little bit more. Um, but uh, if you wanna get into the industry, I would just say, you know, reach out to folks who you uh, envy, who you are proud of, um, folks' uh, work that you follow, uh, stuff that you like. And uh, people are especially journalists. We are more than happy to talk to you because pretty much we just talk all day. Um, but, but reach out to people. Um, you know, reach out to me if that's, if that's something that you want to do. But also, I would say, uh, watch the news. Um, read your local newspaper, um, and also intern. Um, interning was so incredibly important to me. Obviously, you guys have um, the January short-term period where, you know, you could probably work some of that into it if you if you feel like you're uh, passionate about being a journalist. Um, being in a newsroom for the very first time really helped me sort of solidify my love for journalism, my love for telling stories and helping people um, and I just think that if you guys want to do it, go for it because the world really needs good journalists right now. It's, it's so incredibly important. Thank you. That's awesome. 
So Amanda, um, we have uh, one of uh, our parents who's also a trustee who says they don't have a question, but a wow, congrats on all that you have and will accomplish. Truly inspiring. And thanks you for the, your great advice and that that will be shared with her young Griffins. Aw, well, very <laughs> cool. Um, and, and if they need to contact me, if they want to talk further, I'm totally open to that. Terrific. And I think we do, we may have somebody on um, this that wants to say hello now. Can we bring her on screen or bring her up? Oh, she disappeared. Oh, she's back. <laughs> well, that keeps <laughs> happening. So let, let's see if she can come on and, and say hello. Uh, hello. Can hello. you hear me now? Yeah. I hope you can't see me. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> I cannot see you, but, you but I can hear you. It is so wonderful to hear your voice. Hi, Mrs. Wonder. Hi. Sweetheart, I was trying to send you a message. I'm so lame at technology that I, I couldn't get it sent. And I was on the phone, I heard the whole thing and I just, your little, your bubbly voice is the same. And I'm so proud of you. And you didn't oh, tell them how, what a great, you didn't tell them what a great uh, athlete you were. You didn't say how you made us win games a lot of times. Yes, well, I, I um, you know, I try to be humble. What can I say? <laughs> But it's so wonderful to hear your voice. I am so happy for you. I um, I was tuning in when you had your um, when you had your retirement Zoom. I was able to to catch some of that. So I'm just so happy. It makes me so joyful to hear your voice. And uh, before we got on this call, I actually uh, was talking about you, and I was talking about how you are probably one of my favorite humans on this entire earth. So just yeah, know that I are. love and appreciate you, and I appreciate everything um, that you did for me well I appreciate everything you did for me because I think about you so often and I see your smile in my mind oh well I love so, you everybody else is like what are you guys doing right now I'm sorry this <laughs> makes me so happy I know this is being selfish but I'm so glad <laughs> I got to talk to you same. Well, I, I love you very much. And I, I so appreciate you taking little 12 year old Amanda under your wing and helping me <laughs> grow and flourish as a person. Well, it was my pleasure. And I don't think I did that much, but you did a lot for me. And I'm going to quit talking because now I'm going to be crying just like all of them. Sweetie. I love you, Mrs. Wonder. I love you too. Mrs. Wonder, thanks for tuning in. I saw her, you know, kind of popping in and out. She, um, when we Zoom with her, she <laughs> tends to have, you know, she's in the, in the boonies of Indiana. So, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> her, her, her uh, <laughs> cell service isn't always the best, but, um, you know, she, I'm so glad that you were able to connect with her and, um, uh, just share this special moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there are, there are people that are in our lives uh, as we grow and develop that have kind of a, an over, um, over abundant impact on the trajectory of our lives. And, you know, to be able to um, acknowledge and bring you back together, because I can hear that that was true for you. Um, mm -hmm. Mean, means a lot to me as, as head of Royce Moore, so. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well that. thank you. Thanks for that opportunity, that was really special. Yeah. So Amanda, I wanna wrap us up with um, this amazing conversation. I feel like we could continue talking for hours because you are so easy to talk to. You're obviously a great career um, and you're, you know, for, but first of all, I just want to acknowledge you. I want to acknowledge you for Again, using your platform and your life and your talents in such terrific and amazing and life affirming and life changing ways for people. And you're an inspiration to us. And um, we're excited 
about your continued trajectory um, of greatness. So thank you for all. Well, thank you. That that really truly means so much. It um, you know when you think about all of the small pieces of the puzzle that sort of get you to where you are. Uh, Royce Moore was um, probably one of my first pieces, and um, you know to 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 hear that. Obviously, you weren't there when I was in school, but um, just to get that affirmation um, just makes me feel so wonderful, and I am so uh, incredibly grateful for the Royce Moore community, everything that uh, folks did for me when I was there. Um, something that I I didn't have the opportunity to share was um, I had the scholarship from uh, for four years, so I started in seventh grade. That means my scholarship ended when I was a a junior and uh, they sort of brought me up to the office and they were like, listen, we know that uh, you can't afford to stay here, um, but we love you so much and we appreciate everything that you bring to the school. And um, we want to let you stay for the last two years and we want to pay for it. And so, I mean, just that amazing. I'm like tearing up now, but um, that opportunity just to stay in a place that made me feel so special and made me feel so loved um really changed my life so i'm incredibly grateful to Royce more and um i'm just really happy to to have been a part of uh this wonderful legacy oh wow thank you so much for sharing that i i don't think that there's anything more we can say that um can top what you have just shared in um kind of closing out these remarks today um, we're so proud of you, Amanda. Well, thank you. Um, I, um, I hope we will see you back on campus before too long. We really want to welcome you home. Thanks so much. Be well. Take good care of yourself and of your wonderful family. Okay, I sure will. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. Mrs. Wonder, I love you so much. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your weekend.